And my name is Ken Damman, and I'm the president of Fix Democracy First Education Fund. That's more of a utilitarian job. But we, we, like a lot of groups, we have to split ourselves up like that for tax purposes. Anyway, uh, I am so happy to see all you people here. You, you are people who, like those of us who attend our board meetings and, and other activities, haven't given up on democracy. Um, actually, you know, we've never really had a very, even very close to a democracy in the country. But in the last 50 years or so, it's gotten exponentially worse, to the point where rank and file people, even those not paying an awful lot of attention to the specifics of politics, are beginning to, in mass, give up on democracy. And that's, that is what's behind the appeal of uh, uh, somebody that will just come along and tell them that, that they will fix it, that they will make it good. Um, and people are going, oh, thank God. Uh, that's, that's what we need. We don't really need uh, democracy so much as just somebody that's powerful enough to do that. So, it's no exaggeration to say that our government has essentially become a plutocracy hidden inside of the shell of democracy, hiding behind voting and being able to have parties that are at odds with one another, uh, not having to be suppressive like a, like a dictatorship, but nevertheless having a government that seems to always come up with policies that favor the very, very wealthy. That's the thing we're up against now, and the rebellion that people are doing against that puts us in danger of another extreme, and that is to fall under the sway of a demagogue. Um, so our choice now, for the, for the immediate near future, is we're kind of walking a tight rope. We don't want to fall off into tyranny in our country, but we, you know, we have reasonable objections to the plutocracy that is running what looks like a democracy for us. Um, right now, I, the safest bet for us is to stay as much as we can with the status quo because we can work within that to fix it. Once things go to the extreme of tyranny, uh, it's a lot more difficult to, to get that back. So, what I've found, and I, I should tell you that I, I spent 30 years working as a fireman, fire captain, a paramedic in the city of Everett. And uh, one, of the, one, of the things, one of the things you learn in, in being an emergency responder is that while you roll up to a scene that looks pretty dramatic, looks pretty overwhelming, the way you ultimately get, take a, a defeat that situation that you're coming up against is a whole lot of people quietly doing these routine little things that need to be done. Hoses need to be pulled off, links linked together, hydrants need to be cranked, somebody needs to say, okay, I'm in charge and here's what we're gonna do. And, and it's only by having a whole lot of people do these ordinary things that you get that fire out or you tame down that emergency situation. That's very analogous to the situation we're in. So here in, in Fix Democracy First, we keep our eye open for the low-hanging fruit, th uh, things that we can fix in our democracy that will make it a little bit less easy for Plutarchs behind the scenes to, to uh, oligarchs essentially behind the scenes to get in there and, and defeat what is clearly by polls uh, demonstrated to be the, the will of the people. We do the simple things. We ask for you guys' help to, to stay in doing that. And we ask for your understanding to know that, that uh, uh, it's not necessarily big magnanimous things that, uh, that turn the tide. It's a lot of little things. And that's what we'll be asking you to help support us in doing. Okay. Yes.
So now we're going to bring up our keynote speaker tonight. John Bonifaz is a constitutional attorney and co-founder and president of Free Speech for People. John previously served as the executive director and general counsel of the National Voting Rights Institute, an organization he founded in 1994, and as the legal director of Voter Action, a national election integrity organization. He has been at the forefront of key voting rights and democracy campaigns in the United States for more than three decades. John has a long history of defending democracy. He pioneered a series of court challenges, applying political equality principles that have helped to redefine campaign finance question as basic voting rights issue of our time. He helped lead key election protection cases across the country and helped lead historical legal challenges under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment to insurrectionists seeking to run for re-election. It's my honor to now introduce John Boniface. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy, for that very kind introduction. Uh, it's great to be with all of you this evening. I have to say I'm a little embarrassed by this photo, first because I'm wearing the exact same shirt uh, that, that's in that photo, the maybe the suit, and, but my hair is a little grayer, so at least I'm... Uh, but I'm honored to be with all of you this evening, and I'm honored uh, to be part of this broad work that we're doing together to fight for our democracy. You know, I want to come back to something Ken said at the outset. Uh, we're not giving up on democracy. And I love that. I love what he said. And, and the fact is, is that people have asked me over the years, you know, why do I keep going in this fight for our democracy? And really the answer is because of organizations like Fix Democracy First, people at the grassroots level who are standing up and fighting for our democracy all across this country. So I congratulate Cindy and Fix Democracy First for this 20th anniversary and for all that you've been doing over these 20 years, as exhibited in that video, to fight for our democracy here at home. We have to keep going on it. And thank you, Cindy, and thank you, Fix Democracy First. I, I, also, I also am truly inspired by all the awardees tonight and the work that you're doing to fight for our democracy. Uh, it's so critical, uh, you know, what, what is happening in this country and our need to stand up and defend our democracy. Alice said to me uh, just uh, prior to the start of the dinner, maybe the organization needs to cha change its name from Fix Democracy First to Save Democracy First because we are, we are in a fight. Uh, we are in our critical existential fight today for our democracy. I I'm going to first address the work that we've been doing together at Free Speech for People with Fix Democracy First on taking on big money in politics. We got off the ground at Free Speech for People in 2010, January 2010, the day of the Citizens United ruling. And I want to especially recognize Pam Eeks, my friend uh, here from Seattle, who for many years, for, for many years, um, starting, starting when we got off the ground, served on our board of directors and was our, our link, really, uh, to Seattle uh, and, and to so many other uh, people around the country. And, and Pam's been a special friend to free speech of people ever since. But we, we started on the day of the Citizens United ruling with that fight for a constitutional amendment to not only overturn Citizens United, but to overturn the doctrines underlying that ruling of money equaling speech and corporations being treated as people. So to Ken's point, we're not giving up on democracy and we're not giving up on the fight for a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. We have to keep fighting for that amendment, even though it may be tough, it's a fight we have to wage. But the other work that we're doing uh, more recently, beyond the important work that was done to put this on the ballot here in Washington State is one of the first states to put a question on the ballot calling for a constitutional amendment. The other work is the work around advancing this model legislation to end foreign influence corporate spending in our elections. Two years after the Citizens United ruling, the Supreme Court in Blumen v. FEC upheld the long-standing prohibition at the federal level that bans foreign nationals 
from spending money directly or indirectly in our elections at the federal, state, and local level. That's been the law for decades, and it was upheld two years after Citizens United. But it's also important to note that within weeks after Citizens United, then President Obama gave his State of the Union address, and as you may remember, he criticized the Citizens United ruling with the justices seated before him, and Justice Alito famously broke decorum. They're supposed to, you know, when the justices show up, they're supposed to be stoic and not make any indication of where they stand on anything. That's their role. Uh, but no, Justice Alito broke decorum, and when President Obama said this ruling is going to lead to foreign influence in our elections, he famously shook his head, Justice Alito did, and mouthed the words, that's not true. Well, sadly, President Obama's prediction has proven to be true. Not just with the Russian interference in the 2016 election, but the way in which foreign investors can now subvert that existing federal prohibition via the corporate form, via their influence of expenditures of general treasury funds. And what this model legislation does is it closes that loophole that President Obama identified. It ends foreign influence corporate spending in our elections. So as Cindy said, you know, we were uh, giving a presentation at an American Promise conference some years ago about a victory we had won in St. Petersburg uh, with the city council there. And it included this, this model legislation. And, and Cindy came up and said, well, we, we ought to do this in Seattle. I said, great, you know, let's, let's work together. And Seattle, uh, in January of 2020, two months after Amazon had unloaded one and a half million dollars in local races in the city council there, the Seattle city council unanimously passed uh, this ordinance. It became the first jurisdiction in the country to enact it with these thresholds of 1% single stock ownership or 5% in the aggregate foreign investors. You get called a foreign influence corporation and you're barred from spending money in Seattle elections. And, that, and that's a story. So Seattle is leading the way, Fix Democracy First is leading the way, and you know, we quickly worked an arrangement with the city attorney's office to be ready to defend it. We, we thought, okay, here comes Amazon, here come the corporate actors, they're going to try to challenge this in court, and we're going to argue as we were ready to that Bloom and VFEC, that 2012 ruling I just mentioned, uh, allows for this, because this is designed to stop that kind of loophole, foreign influence in our elections. But so far, Seattle hasn't been sued. You know, that standing agreement is there with the city attorney's office. We're ready to defend the law, but it hasn't been sued. It's been in place. And Lorena Gonzalez, who was the city council president at the time who championed this, she has spoken publicly about how it has ended multinational corporate spending in local races in Seattle. Uh, not just Amazon, but all multinational corporations are not able to spend in Seattle. But then, you know, people took notice in other parts of the country. And a couple of legislators, one in the Minnesota House of Representatives, one in the Minnesota Senate, they learned about the Seattle Ordinance, and they introduced it. Without our coordination, they went ahead and introduced it in the state legislature there. And we reached out. We said we were ready to help. It didn't get through in that first cycle. But you know what? This year... The state of Minnesota became the first state in the country to enact this bill to end foreign influence corporate spending in elections. And, and, and you know, sometimes, sometimes you know you're on the right track when the opposition shows up. And the opposition showed up in that fight in Minnesota. They showed up in the floor debates. Uh, they, they cried foul about their corporate speech rights being violated. Uh, and they didn't prevail there. The state went ahead and passed it, even though they, they threatened to sue. And then they quickly have sued. The Minnesota Chamber of Commerce has sued the state of Minnesota to try to strike down this law. The Minnesota Attorney General's Office has issued a statement saying they're going to vigorously defend this law to defend democracy in Minnesota. And we're going to be right there with them in helping to fight to defend uh, this law. It's a critical, critical reform to not deal with overturning Citizens United, we can't do that until we 
have that constitutional amendment, but to deal with the worst abuses of the Citizens United ruling. And you know what state is next beyond Minnesota? Washington State. Washington State. As the senators know from the table where I'm sitting, the state senate of Washington State passed this legislation in this past session. And it went into the House. There wasn't enough time for it to be fully considered, but we're coming right back in the next session with this bill. We're, we're thrilled that the state senate is already on board, uh, and we really want uh, the state house to, to get on board and have Washington become the second state to do this. State Representative Mena has signed on to champion this bill uh, in, the, in the House. Uh, Senator Wynn has been championing it in the Senate, uh, and it can be done. And I know Fixed Democracy First is going to be a lead fight with Washington Bus and others uh, in making this happen. Uh, you know, 98%, 98% of the S&P 500 are foreign influence corporate actors. And, and you know, I, I understand, you know, people, people say, well, you know, 1% sounds pretty low. 1%, you know, you're going to say that that's a foreign influence corporation. Well, John Coates, who's a corporate law expert, Harvard Law professor, former general counsel to the SEC, he has testified in support of this legislation. He testified before the Seattle City Council. And what he has said, and it's true, is that a 1% single stock owner of an of a S&P 500 company owns hundreds of millions of dollars of shares of that company. They can get the CEO on the phone. They're known to the CEO and the management of that corporation. They have significant influence over the decision making of the expenditure of the general treasury funds. So whenever you hear in the debate that may happen in Washington State or elsewhere that this sounds like it's, it's too low, it's, it's covering too many corporations, no, in reality we're dealing with the influence of foreign investors even at that level that needs to be stopped. And that's what this fight is about. So we're thrilled and honored to be working with Fixed Democracy First in advancing this legislation. It is pending in many other states, including New York State, where it's passed the state senate, Hawaii, where it's passed the state senate, California, where it's going to have a vote in the California Assembly this coming January, Massachusetts, where it's likely to go to the ballot in 2026, and it's pending in the U.S. Congress. Congressman Jamie Raskin has championed this on the House side. He has 30-plus co-sponsors uh, from across the Democratic caucus. Uh, and on the Senate side, Senator Elizabeth Warren has introduced it as part of a broad anti-corruption package. And our national partner, the Center for American Progress, has done some polling on this. This is widely popular. 70-plus percent of people across the political spectrum want to end foreign influence corporate spending in our elections. So we're going to get this done. We're going to pass this historic bill wherever uh, we can. And, and again, we're honored to be working with Fixed Democracy First in this fight. The, the next, the ne thank you. You know, the, the next area I want to highlight is the area of the fight to protect our right to vote and our elections. And Senator Cooter, I, I, I congratulate you for both your award, but your leadership on this here in Washington State. Uh, you know, this is a fight. We have, we have forces all across this country who want to suppress the vote, who want to intimidate voters, who want to disenfranchise voters. And, and, and I think it's extremely admirable that Washington State is standing up to be a model for the country and showing what it means to protect the right to vote and to protect our elections. We are engaged at Free Speech for People in litigation across the country in taking on those voter suppression bills and those efforts to intimidate voters. In Arizona, there are two different federal court cases we're now involved in on behalf of organizations, voting rights organizations there, challenging new voter suppression laws. In Texas, we're going to trial starting this Monday uh, with many other groups in challenging a voter suppression law that was enacted after the 2020 election. And the other thing the Senator said that I want to highlight is so much of this is fueled by that big lie that there was some kind of massive fraud in the 2020 election. That, that big lie is being used to pass these kinds of bills to suppress the vote. And, and we've got to be vigilant in fighting to stand up for the right to vote in the midst of, of these kinds of attacks. And the other area 
where we're very active is on illegal voter intimidation. We are challenging that uh, wherever we can. In Minnesota, days before, really within weeks before the November 2020 election, a private mercenary company out of Tennessee started to advertise on military sites for ex-special forces to show up, to be hired, to show up as armed guards at polling sites in Minneapolis and St. Paul in their view to guard against Antifa and Black Lives Matter. Now, you know, not many people are reading military sites, we weren't, but we read the Washington Post when the CEO decided to, uh, to get interviewed by the Washington Post about his plan of, of this company to send armed guards uh, to, to Minneapolis and St. Paul. And we decided, uh, you know, this has to be stopped. So we went into federal court on behalf of the Center for American Islamic Relations of Minnesota and the Legal Women Voters of Minnesota, and we sued uh, this company in federal court to stop this illegal voter intimidation plan. He hadn't, they hadn't begun to implement it, but they had it in, in, in implementation for plans to put it together. And, you know, we got before a Trump appointee. And, you know, you might wonder, okay, how, how's that going to fare? But the evidence was so overwhelming that this was going to intimidate voters, that having armed agents at the polls was going to intimidate voters, that this federal judge issued an injunction barring, barring this kind of plan from being put forward for the November election. And then, after that, we won a consent decree barring their activity through the 2024 cycle. And this is the kind of fight that has to be waged to block voter intimidation. And the other thing I'll... I'll add to it is, you know, this was done under what's known as Section 11B of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. That section makes clear that voter intimidation is prohibited, but it's rarely used by private parties. It's mostly been used by the Department of Justice and by state attorneys general to try and block voter intimidation. This was only one of the few cases that had been brought by private parties. And we're now in Colorado in a similar kind of fight. And there, uh, that's about a organization they call themselves the U.S. Election Integrity Plan. They're a, an extremist QAnon-inspired group fueled by this big lie. They're going door to door, door to door, sometimes as armed agents, taking photographs of people's homes. They have the voter list that they purchased. They're asking questions. They're making allegations at the door. Did you vote fraudulently in the 2020 election? What about your husband, Joe, whose name they have? You know, did, did he vote fraudulently? It's intended to chill participation in the voting process. And if you're a newer voter or you're a voter from a disenfranchised community, you're going to be particularly intimidated. So we represent the NAACP of Colorado, the Leo Women Voters of Colorado, Me Familia Vota, and we're in federal court challenging this illegal voter intimidation. And it's critical. This fight is critical because this kind of door-to-door -door activity that's been happening with this big lie is going to other states where people think they now can show up at people's doors to claim that they voted fraudulently in the 2020 election. I'll tell you something, though. Their, their counsel, they've tried everything they can to stop this case. First, they filed a motion to dismiss. They lost that in federal court. Then they filed counterclaims against our clients, arguing abusive process. They lost that in federal court. Then they filed what's known as a motion for summary judgment, saying there's not enough evidence. They lost that in federal court. This case is headed to trial in February of next year, and it's important we put them on trial for what they're trying to do in intimidating voters in Colorado or anywhere else in the country where they might try this kind of activity. So the fight for the right to vote is critical today. But there's a third fight I want to... I want to talk about, which is about challenging insurrectionists who have taken an oath of office and then turn around and engage in insurrection. Under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, anyone who takes an oath of office to defend the Constitution and then engages in insurrection is forever barred, forever barred from holding public office again. The history, the history of this provision, of course, dates back to the Reconstruction era after the Civil War. 
It was placed by the framers of the 14th Amendment in there precisely to address the threat that ex-Confederates placed on the country who had been in positions of power, who had taken that oath of office, and then turned around and engaged in an insurrection, the first insurrection in our nation's history, the Civil War. That's why we have that provision. Those framers of the 14th Amendment decided it was critical, not from a punishment standpoint. This isn't about criminal liability. That's a separate issue. This is about protecting the republic. If you take that oath to defend the Constitution, and then you decide to engage in a violent uprising to try to overturn the government, you don't deserve to be in public office again. That's the idea of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. And as we know, we now have had a second insurrection in our nation's history on January 6, 2021. And the insurrectionists in chief, who happened to be sitting in the Oval Office, incited that insurrection, mobilized that insurrection, facilitated that insurrection. He is exhibit A for why we need Section 3 of the 14th Amendment and why it applies directly to him. He is disqualified. He is disqualified from holding future public office. So in June, in June of 2021, we issued letters to every Secretary of State in the country, every Chief Election Official, and the District of Columbia, making clear that if Donald Trump were to seek public office again, run for president again, or seek any public office, that their responsibility as Secretary of State, as Chief Election Official, would be to bar him from the ballot to enforce Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Now, people might say, well, how is it that a Secretary of State could have that kind of power. Well, you know what? Their responsibility is to ensure that anyone appearing on their ballot meets the constitutional qualifications for the office that they seek. If you're 25 years old, and this happened in the state of California, and you want to run for president, you're barred from the ballot. My, my daughter's 17. I think she'd make a great candidate for president of the United States. But she is not eligible you got to be 35 under the Constitution. So California barred a 25-year-old, and she lost that case as a result of, of that disqualification. You also have to be a citizen by birth. Now, there's plenty of people who argue that should be changed, and, that, and that's, that's fine. We ought to have that discussion if we want to amend the Constitution. But the current qualification, you got to be a citizen by birth. So a naturalized citizen in Colorado some years ago sought to challenge that and run for president. He, too, was disqualified. And then Judge Gorsuch of the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld that decision and said that states have the authority to protect the integrity of their ballot and make sure that people meet the constitutional qualifications for the office that they seek. This is no different. Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is a qualification requirement just like the age qualification, the citizenship qualification. So we issued those letters. But we knew, you know, that people were going to say, well, it's not quite right. You know, we don't know if he's going to run again. That's fine. We wanted to lay the groundwork. And then in 2022, last year, we initiated the first cases in 150 years under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. We challenged the eligibility of Madison Cawthorn, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Paul Gosar, Andy Biggs, and Mark Fincham, all for being insurrectionists who had taken that oath of office and were ineligible for running for public office again. We didn't prevail, to be fair, in getting them barred from the ballot. But what we did prevail on is winning critical federal court precedent in the Cawthorn case and in the Green case that we will apply to these challenges to Donald Trump. We've been quite clear that we are going to go to the courts in multiple states challenging Donald Trump's eligibility to be on the state ballots. And, and those precedents include a federal court precedent, federal appeals court precedent out of the Cawthorn case that makes clear that the insurrectionist disqualification clause, section three of the 14th Amendment, applies to our modern day. Now, Madison Cawthorn argued through his attorney that he was exempt because in 1872, Congress passed what's known as the Amnesty uh, Act. Uh, and the Amnesty Act was designed uh, to deal with ex-Confederates who 
you know, the decision was made to bring the North and South together and to allow for ex-Confederates to come back and run for office. Historical error in our view, but nevertheless, that was passed. But what he did not do is he did not say, we're going to repeal Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. That can only be done with a constitutional amendment. And it didn't say prospectively, we're preventing application of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. But Madison Cawthorn nevertheless went into court and he argued that the Amnesty Act of 1872 applied to him 150 years later, that he too was now immune from Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. He got a federal district court judge to buy that absurd idea, but we ultimately got it overturned by the Federal Appeals Court of the Fourth Circuit, and that remains precedent to apply uh, to Donald Trump. The other, the other precedent we won was out of a federal district court in Atlanta when he rushed, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene rather, and her attorneys rushed into federal court to try to block the proceedings from going forward in Georgia. And Amy Tomberg, federal judge there, issued a 70-page ruling making clear that states had the authority to enforce Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. You may remember she was forced to testify under oath for three hours. She claimed she couldn't remember anything about what happened on January 6 or any of her conversations with Donald Trump, but she was the first member of Congress in our history to be forced to testify under oath about the role they played in an insurrection. These precedents will be applied uh, to Donald Trump. And, you know, these fights, these fights to protect our democracy, whether it's taking on big money in politics, whether it's protecting our right to vote in our elections, or whether it's upholding Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, they're all critical for the defense of our democracy. But I, I want to come back to Ken's opening point. You know, we're not giving up. And there's plenty of reasons, I understand, why people get frustrated, they get cynical, they get, they, 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 they get challenged about staying hopeful. And it's tough work, right? I mean, it's tough work in this environment to keep fighting. But we have to keep moving forward. We have to keep fighting. The opposition, those who are the anti-democratic forces, small d, in our country would like us to give up. That's, that's what they want. But we have to keep fighting. And there are three, there are three people I just want to reference uh, for making sure we're continuing to keep fighting. Doris Haddock, Mahatma Gandhi, and Frank Sinatra. Now, I realize those are uh, three different, very different people, but I'll explain how they're linked. First, Doris Haddock. For those who don't know, Doris Haddock, otherwise known as Granny D, decided to walk across the country at the age of 88 on January 1st, 1999, to walk across the country to reform our nation's campaign finance system. She set out from California, 88 years old. She practiced some of it. She began to do some practice walks in New Hampshire where she lives. But then she went out to California and she began this journey, 10 miles a day, walking. She walked through the rain, through the wind, through the snow. She crossed country skied in places. Random strangers came out of their homes. They walked with her for part of the way. They fed her. They housed her. Thirteen months later, turning 89 and 90 in the process. She was born on January 24th, so she had two birthdays during that 13 months. She reached Washington, D.C. to be greeted by thousands of people led by then-Senator John McCain and Senator Russ Feingold. I was honored to have been one of those greeting her and welcoming her that day. She was an inspiration for what it means to fight for our democracy. Two months after Citizens United, she passed away at the age of 100. And, you know, she actually thought about when Citizens United came down, walking across the country again. Uh, but, you know, I thought about the fact when she passed away that when she was born, the 19th Amendment guaranteeing women the right to vote had yet to be enacted. She saw in her lifetime nine amendments passed by the United States Congress and enacted by the states. She is an example that change can happen in a lifetime. Doris Haddock, Granny D. The second person I mentioned, Mahatma Gandhi, famously said, first they ignore you, 
Then they laugh at you. Then they fight you. Then you win. And, and we have to remember right now, they're no longer ignoring us. They're no longer laughing at us. They're fighting us now, and we're going to win. And this is the fight that has to be waged for our democracy. So now comes Frank Sinatra. So my friend Pam Eeks has a little handout here. And uh, I hope that you'll join me on this. So there's a song uh, that Frank Sinatra is known for. It's actually uh, not written by him, but he's known for having made it popular. It's written by James. The music's written by James Van Hoosen and lyrics by Sammy Kahn. So I've got a handout for each of you. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to sing the whole thing with me, but the part that's in bold is what I hope you'll join me in. Now, I, I will say that, you know, I've done this on a few occasions, and on, on one occasion it was a, a talk I gave at Harvard Law School for the class of, of, of students going into public interest law, and, and those who were supporting uh, their decision to go into public interest law. And the dean uh, at the time was Elena Kagan. And I, we did the same thing. We passed this out. And uh, I will say that Dean Kagan at the time, now Justice Kagan, uh, she belted this out. She helped out in saying this. So I hope uh, you'll be inspired to join in that. So what I'll do, uh, there's actually uh, one little change I, I, I suggest we make here, which is the last three lines uh, have plant ending that line. Uh, I'm only going to do plant for the very third last line. The other two, I'll keep out plant. So I'll, I'll do it first just to get us going, and then I hope you'll join us. Just what makes that little old ant think he'll move that rubber tree plant? Anyone knows an ant can't move a rubber tree plant, but he's got high hopes. He's got high hopes. He's got high apple pie in the sky hope so anytime you're getting low instead of letting go just remember that and oops there goes another rub tree oops there goes another rub tree oops there goes another rub tree plant keep fighting fix democracy first we're right there with you and we're proud to keep this fight going thank you so much we're going to start talking a little bit about how it all started. So, um, it started back in 2001. A group of concerned citizens took up the cause because of the 1990s um, by the Washington Council for Foreign Elections to repeal a ban on public funding of local elections included in the 1992 Campaign Finance Reform Initiative 134. Before that, in the 1980s, Seattle and King County had public funding in their elections, but because this got added to that initiative, it pretty much banned public funding in elections. So Washington Public Campaigns was born to take up that cause to continue the work that the Washington Council for, for Elections started. So they began lobbying the legislature for clean election bills as the momentum for public funding for campaigns grew. And then the education um, fund actually started a few years later in 2007. Um, in 2005, Craig Salins came on as the executive director. And then in 2007 was the first awards banquet. So this has been going on for quite a while, though we did have a break between the banquets. We had one planned for 2020, but everybody knows what happened in 2020, and we had to cancel that. And then a big win in 2008, the ban on campaign funding was finally lifted via the state legislature, allowing public funding in local elections. That was a big deal. And then in 2010 to 2012, a new mission started because they were successful in getting that ban lifted, at least for local elections. And so Washington Public Campaigns turned their attention to the, as you all know, the 2010 Citizens United decision by the U.S. Supreme Court that basically opened the floodgates for money to just pour into our elections. And so it, working with groups to pass resolutions 
to, in supporting a 28th Amendment to the Constitution to overturn that decision as well as other Supreme Court decisions that unfortunately we don't have time to get into. Um, but it's really important to realize that there's only two ways we can change a Supreme Court decision. One is the court has to reverse itself and the other is a, a, an amendment to the Constitution. We've had 27 amendments. It's been a long time since we've had one. So we think it's time to do that. And then um, in 2012, oh, and it's really, uh, I forgot to mention that in 2012, uh, Washington uh, Public Campaigns started to collaborate with the Occupy movement and created an anti-corporate rally in, in the coalition GMOP, which is Get Money Out of Politics. I know Norm Conrad in the back was one of those early members of that. Um, and then they also began to work with Move to Amend, which is a national organization calling for a constitutional amendment to reverse Citizens United. Unfortunately, in August of that year, in 2012, Craig Salins, the executive director at that time, died suddenly of a heart attack. And so Alice Bolt, who we're honoring tonight, stepped into that role and took over as executive director of Fixed Democracy. I'm sorry, Washington Public Campaigns. We haven't got to Fixed Democracy first yet. Next slide, we'll get there. So the, the continued focus, let me just make sure I got my notes here. Washington Public Campaigns became a coalition partner with the Coalition to Amend the Constitution, which is WAMEN, that Linda Brewster mentioned earlier, and began planning a statewide ballot initiative for 2014 that would call for a constitutional amendment to reverse that 2010 Citizens United decision. They had already been trying to go through the state legislature to do this, but unfortunately the state legislature wasn't helpful. So they decided an initiative was what we needed to do. So, and between 2013 and 2015, um, there was a lot going on around public funding. So Washington Public Campaigns worked to pass the Fair Elections, FES for Public Financing of Seattle Campaigns that was adopted by Seattle Ethics and Elections Committee and the City Council for the 2013 ballot. Unfortunately, that was Prop 1. It lost by only 1,400 votes, but it did pave the way for Initiative 122, Honest Elections, um, in 2015 that created the Seattle Democracy Voucher Program, which many of us are big fans of. And then in 2014, Washington Public Campaigns decided to change its name to Fix Democracy First in order to work on a broader scope of democracy reforms. And then the Ed Fund became Fix Democracy First Education Fund, and we've been under that name ever since. So big things happened in 2014 to 2016 around the ballot initiatives. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Fixed Democracy worked with Wallman Coalition to support first initiative 1329. This was an initiative to the people. It was the first attempt of a statewide uh, initiative calling for a 28th Amendment, which didn't gather enough signatures to qualify for the ballot. And I do want to call out Diane Jones in the back that was a leader of that uh, initiative back then. So after 2013, what we did have is we didn't have much money, right Diane? Remember that, we didn't have much money. But we had a lot of volunteers and a lot of really committed people. And so we said, hey, let's do it again, but a do initiative to the legislature that give us a longer time frame to collect those signatures. So that's what we did. We um, started initiative 735. We collected enough signatures um, to get on the ballot. We had 90% of our signatures were collected by volunteers, which is huge. And then Fix Democracy First, they, they raised money to collect the other 40,000 signatures to get us over the top. So between Fixed Democracy First and Woman, we had enough signatures to get on the 2016 ballot. Um, the, and I also, um, Linda Brewster mentioned earlier, but Linda Bach collected over 21,000 signatures for that ballot initiative, which I still think is a state record. I have no way to prove it, but I think that's a state record. And then, 
We had a huge win in 2016. Initiative 735 won with approval rating of almost 63%, and we won in all 10 congressional districts across the state. We actually, we actually won almost every county. We lost Penderay County by five votes. So we, we, it was huge for us. And um, I was the campaign director for Initiative 735. That's the year I gave up my business selling art supplies to come do this work full time. And then Alice at that time had decided to retire and they were looking for a new executive director and I said, hey, I think I want to do that. So after I uh, did the campaign director for 735, I stayed on as the new director of, seven, um, of Fixed Democracy First. So, what have we been doing since then? So there's a lot of going on between, so after the 2016 election, um, we decided what else do we want to do? So we began to expand our focus. Um, at that point, WAMEN decided, because they were they accomplished their mission in getting that initiative passed, um, um, WAMEN merged with Fixed Democracy First to join forces in order to continue and strengthen the work needed for our democracy reforms. And then in 2017, a, a fair vote started. We started talking about ranked choice voting and proportional representation. And so Fixed Democracy First was the first sponsor organization for Fair Vote Washington to focus on these issues. And then Fairvote became their own organization later on in 2018. So we're happy to continue to partner with them. And then we also decided we needed to do more civic education and outreach. So Fixed Democracy First Education Fund, we expanded our voter outreach and civic education, which included voter registration and info booths at festivals and events. Juan Vega over there at the table, he was instrumental in um, helping us set up those events. Him and I spend a lot of time sitting at those booths at those festivals. And in particular, Hempfest was one of our biggest ones. I remember one, one year we, we did 3,000 voter registrations in one weekend at Hempfest. It was pretty amazing. And we decided that we also wanted to do other things like educational forums on campaign finance, ranked choice voting, redistricting, election security, fair courts, and others. So we helped work with um, what used to be the Democracy Hub under the win-win. We worked with them and did a, a bunch of events. So we really expanded our um, outreach and civic education during that time. So 2018 to 2020, we had a ton of legislative wins, but mostly it had to work in coalition. And I want to talk about that because it's really important for us. Um, in 2018, we did our first Fixed Democracy First and League of Women Voters lo lobby. Um, well, it was actually lobby day. It's a lobby week now since we went virtual, but it was a lobby day. And um, it, it was so successful that we decided to do it every year. And so coming up in 2024 will be the seventh year that we've done the Democracy Lobby Week with the League of Women Voters. Um, we also worked very closely as part of the Washington Voting Justice Coalition to pass the Access to Democracy package of reforms, which included automatic voter registration, same-day voter registration, pre-registration for 16 and 17-year-olds, the Washington Voting Rights Act, and also the Disclose Act of 2018. That was a huge year for that, and one of more democracy reforms passed that year, not just our state, but across the country that year. It was really a great year for democracy. And then in 2019, more things passed, prepaid postage for ballots, which King County started. We honored, actually, Julie Wise, the last time we were in person back in 2019, for leading that. We also passed the Washington Native Americans Voting Rights Act, ended prison gerrymandering, so people had to be counted, not in the where the location of the prison for redistricting, but where they actually lived before that, and the pack to pack disclosure. Those two disclosure bills now um, makes uh, Washington State some of the top, um, one of the, or the top state for disclosure laws in the country. And then, <laughs> and 
And then in 2020, we worked with Free Speech for People, John Boniface, our speaker tonight, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. We, it, it all happened because I was attending a conference. John was giving a presentation on St. Petersburg, Florida, and what they did down there to try to get limits on independent expenditure packs. And I went up to him afterwards, I go, hey, we should do something like that in Seattle. And so we started work on the clean campaigns um, that um, call for uh, the independent expenditure limits. Unfortunately, that part didn't stay. But the other two pieces, the banning foreign influence corporations from donating to Seattle elections, did pass. And that means that corporations like Amazon, Starbucks, Boeing, the list goes on. If they have a 1% a single foreign owner or 5% combined foreign ownership, they cannot donate to Seattle elections. So we haven't seen the big corporate money pouring in since that passed. legislation wins. Uh, 2021, voting rights restoration pass. It was a huge win. This means that as soon as somebody is released from prison, if they've been in prison for a felony conviction, as soon as they leave prison, they can register and vote in the upcoming election. Before, they used to have to wait until they were off community custody. This was a huge win. And I know Juan has been fighting for that one for a long time. And then we also had prison gerrymandering for local jurisdictions pass, and then fiscal statement for ballot uh, measures and campaign funds for child care and other type of caregiving um, uh, work. And then in 2022, we got the new People Power Elections Washington Coalition form public funding and campaign finance forms. And I want to give a shout out to Washington Bus because they were instrumental in getting us to get that coalition started. And just this year, we also had some good wins, the Voting Rights Act enhancements, abolishing advisory votes. Yay to Senator Cooter over there. We also updated automatic voter registration online, which the bus spearheaded. And, and, um, and I'm sorry, they worked on expanding online voter registration, and we worked with the um, uh, Washington Voting Justice on the automatic voter registration. But the Washington bus spearheaded, allowing people to use the last four digits of their social security number on online as well. So some big wins over the last few years. So we've also been expanding, um, and I call this the, um, the uh, pandemic years, because we weren't able to go out in person, so we decided to go online. And, and um, we started the YOVO program. Actually, it started even a little earlier. We officially changed the name to YOVO, but in 2019, we started, Juan and I started going to middle schools and doing voter outreach on um, for why voting matters, history of voting, and things like that. Um, and that had grown for quite a while, but unfortunately the pandemic slowed us down and we weren't able to get out there. And then in 2020, I started the Democracy Happy Hour. That's on Wednesday nights at 5 o'clock. Which I'm still shocked people show up for that thing. Um, but I cover democracy in the news, and, and I, I'll I told this to a lot of people, it started as a coffee hour at like 11 on Wednesday mornings and no nobody was showing up. So I changed the name to Democracy Happy Hour and changed it to 5 o'clock, and that made a huge difference. <laughs> but we cover democracy in the news, and then we usually have speakers come in and talk about a particular topic related to democracy. So that's been very successful. We get somewhere about 50 to 70 people showing up every week to listen to that. And then in 2022, we started the Women in Office Now Program 1 to expand gender parity on the state legislative level um, to get more women elected to office. But we're also not just interested in state offices. We're interested in local offices, county councils, and um, city councils, and things like that. So. And uh, we, we did that with a grant from the Ascend Fund, which we're going to be continuing that work. And then just this past year, we started a partnership with Generation Citizen to try to get into high schools to teach teachers how to do student community projects 
around civic education where the students get to pick the project. So that's just getting started, so more to come on that. So where do we go from here? The work continues, yeah, it does. So just, uh, this is not everything we're working on. This is just kind of a summary. Um, obviously, with people-powered elections, Washington, the Washington bus, and others, we're working on trying to get a statewide democracy voucher program. We're also talking about a possible pilot program for maybe county councils. We did get a bill introduced this past session with Representative Daria Farvar. Unfortunately, we didn't get very far with that, so we are planning to do a work session in the um, House State Government and Tribal Relations. And I just want to give a shout out to the people at the bus. Jasmine runs our policy team. Uh, Cynthia is on the steering committee and others, so they've been a big part of that coalition and getting it going. And if you live in Seattle, you need to know that the Democracy Voucher Program levy, it's paid for through a property tax levy, has to be renewed every 10 years. And that's coming up in the next couple of years. So we're going to be working on that Seattle, Seattle levy renewal to continue the voucher program in Seattle. And then tackling money in elections, we want to get a statewide ban on foreign influence corporations donating to, donating to Washington elections. And it was added on to a separate PDC bill this last session, but we're hoping to get a standalone bill in the Senate. Um, Free Speech for People is working on that, Washington Bus is working on that, and others, so we're hoping to get further this year. And we haven't given up that fight for a constitutional amendment to reverse decisions like Citizens United. That's gonna be an ongoing battle until we get there. We also wanna change the way we vote and the way we redistrict. Um, ranked choice voting, proportional representation. We have several people, Lisa Aro, David Banks from Fair Vote Washington. That's a really important long term and hoping to get that local options bill is going to be a uh, focus this for uh, local uh, jurisdictions can adopt ranked choice voting. And we're working also with Cindy Madigan and others working on multi-member districts and proportional representation. So a lot of work with um, other partners. And we really want to, in redistricting, we're also working on a league for an independent redistricting commission, which is a long-term goal. So that's important. And we really want to increase civic education and engagement. Um, Juan is going to be taking over the YOBO program and doing some work on that end. And we're going to continue um, working with Generation Citizen to move that forward. We'd really like to see expanded civic education in K through 12. We don't want one class in high school. They should be getting it all through school. And doing more student-led projects. Ultimately, we really want to achieve gender and racial parity in our government, and because it really means better representation and better policies for all of us. I will also add economic parity, too, because we need people representing that not wealthy people that are running government regular people, and we need to have opportunities like public funding so people can run for elections, right? Those kind of things. So, but we really need to do this through systemic change. That's really how we get there. And speaking of coalitions, we didn't do this work with by in a bubble. We did this with other groups. The Voting Justice Coalition, People Power Elections Washington, Washington for Equitable Records, Racism, let me start that again. <laughs> Washington for Equitable Representation, Washington Community Alliance, Fair Vote Washington, Meaningful Movies, Free the Vote, Washington Bus, League of Women Voters, Poor People's Campaign. We work with all of these organizations, and that's not everybody. These are the ones that um, I had logos for. <laughs> Uh, we work with also Free Speech for People. We're part of Declaration for American Democracy, which is almost 300 organizations across the country working on federal reform. A lot of the stuff that we passed in Washington, we're trying to get that passed federally. Um, we also are members of National Association of Nonpartisan Reformers, Civic X Now, 
um, Send Fund Pro Rep, Bridge Lines, Move to Amend, Public Citizen, Represent Us. These are all these organizations that we work with. So um, that's, we can't do this work without working with others, and that's so important. <laughs>